Hey everybody, so today we're going to look at getting MIDI into Macs, and specifically we'll be looking at the Noise Machine SVE MIDI controller, which is a wireless, rechargeable Bluetooth MIDI controller, but this tutorial will apply to any MIDI device you happen to have connected to your machine. If you have the NMSVE, you can go to thisisnoiseinc.com, go to the product manuals, and you'll see instructions for connecting to Mac and connecting to Windows. Follow those instructions to get your device connected. And once you turn on the device, the first thing you have to do is choose a MIDI channel on which it will communicate. There's 12 options and you can select them using any of the 12 buttons. So if we want this to communicate on channel one, we just hit the leftmost, top leftmost button and the blue Bluetooth LED will begin to flash, meaning that it's ready to connect to the computer. So if you're on Mac, in the audio MIDI setup, you can go to Show MIDI Studio, click on the Bluetooth icon here, configure Bluetooth, and your device should show up in the list of devices. Click Connect, and then your device is connected to the computer and will show up in Max. To test that, we're going to make a note in object and double click that note in object and we should see our device, our NMSVE, in the list of devices for that object. We can use an integer number box here to test that it's working when I press a button on the device values come in through this note in object. We're going to look at this in more detail in a moment, but first I just want to step back and talk about for a second what is MIDI? Because the term gets tossed around a lot and rarely does it get well defined. MIDI is a protocol for devices to talk to each other or pieces of software to talk to each other or devices to talk to software. And we're already familiar with one protocol, which is ASCII. We've looked at the key object and the key up object. And what these do is they report the ASCII code of the key pressed on the keyboard. So when I press A, key reports 97. And when I release A, key up reports 97. If I hold down the shift key and send a capital A, that's key 65. And when I release it, key up 65. So note that there's no information about the content delivered through this protocol. It happens to be A and capital A, but as we've seen, we can trigger sounds with that, we can trigger fades with that, we can trigger videos with that, we can enable and disable layers or start processes with that. So the protocol is about getting letters, getting keyboard information into the computer, but we don't need to use the protocol in the way that it's designed. We can, and certainly that's how word processors work and that's how email works by taking these ASCII codes and using them literally as letters so that we can type letters onto the screen. So MIDI is the same thing. It's a protocol that was designed for musical instruments to communicate with each other. And so just like the ASCII protocol is optimized for textual information, sending letters, punctuation, numbers. The MIDI protocol is optimized for sending information from keyboards to synthesizers. So in MIDI, we have note numbers which represent which key is being pressed. We have velocity, which represents how quickly the key is depressed. We have pitch bend, which represents the position of a wheel that bends the pitch of a particular note. And then there's always lots of knobs and dials and sliders on synthesizers. And those are represented through what are called continuous controllers. And there, there's a few more pieces of information that are passed down MIDI. Uh, for instance, aftertouch, which is how hard you're pressing on a key 
while it's down. And again, these are very useful protocols for a keyboard communicating with a synthesizer, but we don't need to necessarily use them that way. We can treat them the same way we treat ASCII, which just are numbers representing a change in one device that's communicated to another device. And traditionally, MIDI has been transmitted on a five pin DIN connector like this. Increasingly, we're seeing MIDI being transmitted on a mini connector, a TRS mini connector like this. Um, also, many devices communicate via MIDI over USB. And in this case, we're communicating with the noise machine SVE over Bluetooth. So MIDI isn't about a particular cable or a particular type of connection. It's about the protocol. It's about the type of information that's being transmitted. So that's what this note in object is about. This is an object that accesses incoming MIDI information, specifically notes. So on a MIDI keyboard, we would hit a note and it would come in this note in object with the note number in the left position here and the velocity or how quickly the key was depressed in the middle position and in the right position, the MIDI channel, which recall when we turned on our SVE, we set the MIDI channel to one. So when I hit a button here, I see when I depress the button, the velocity is 100. And when I release the button, the velocity is zero. And this 36 is being sent twice. If we put a button here, we can see this. So it's first it's sending note number 36 with a velocity of 100, and then when I release it, it's note number 36 with a velocity of zero. And every note on this device is on channel, channel one. The other thing to note here is that this slider is currently in the leftmost position, and we'll talk about this slider a bit more in a minute. Um, but for right now, keep the slider in the leftmost position. We're not dealing with the dial yet. So these are only notes in the sense that they're being communicated on the MIDI note channel of the MIDI connection. But of course, we don't need to use them as notes. We can use them in exactly the same way that we used keys with the key object. So for instance, we could say select 36 and something will happen. when we hit this button, and something will happen when we release this button. And they just count upwards, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, etc. So a very common thing to do if we have an odd starting number like 36 is just do some subtraction. So we'll subtract 35 from that so that our upper leftmost button is 1 which is much easier to deal with. So these are now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's nice. Let's take a step back because this note in object, we double clicked it to select our device, but there's a better way to see what devices are available and to choose one. And that's the MIDI info object. Send MIDI info the controller's message, and it will populate a U menu with all the available devices. And we've seen the U menu several times before. And then just connect the left outlet of the U menu to the node in, send the controller message, and we get a list that we can choose from. And this is useful because if we have multiple objects, we don't want to have to double click them all every time we open up our patch. For instance, there's the control in object, which is how we're going to access the knob. We can set both of these and as many objects as we want just by accessing the pull down menu. And if we want to see that dial coming in, we can see that It's controller number one on MIDI channel one, and its value is from zero to 127. 
And to get a nice graphical representation of that, there is a dial object in Max that defaults to a 0 to 127 range, as many objects in Max do, because Max is designed to work with MIDI. And you can change the style of the dial object. This is the dial. In the inspector, you can change the colors, and there's a range of drawing styles. For instance, the pie slice. And now this dial is in pie slice mode. So you can see the value. And like many objects in Max, the dial is also a user interface object. So if I take a dial, it doesn't only display incoming information, it also sends information. So you can click this dial to change values. So let's take a look at this slider. So far we've had this slider in the leftmost position, which has given us note numbers 36 through 47, or buttons 1 through 12 after subtraction. As we move this lever to the right, you'll notice there's a green LED here that's lit. As we move the lever to the right, the green LED will turn off. And now we're in the second bank, or the second octave, which is note numbers 48 through 59, or buttons 13 through 24. So we've gone to a new page of the NMSVE. And there's seven pages in total, so if we continue to move the slider to the right, we'll see the green LED comes back on, and now we're in the third bank. And if this were a musical keyboard, this note number 60 would be middle C. Moving further to the right, we go into the next bank, the LED goes back off, now we're notes number 72 through 83, and all the way to the right in our final bank. It's note numbers 108 through 119, or buttons 73 through 84. So by moving this fader around, we can access seven different pages, which essentially turns these 12 buttons into 84 buttons. But of course there's a problem with this in live performance. Um, if we're on stage holding this, maybe this is in our costume or in our pocket, um, these small adjustments are going to be problematic. So there's several solutions we can take to that. And in general, there's a lot of different solutions for how to work with a device like this in a live performance setting. Um, so let's just take a quick look at that. If we wanted, for instance, this fader to be completely disabled so that it didn't matter what position it was in, that would be a, a mathematical operation called a modulo. And what modulo is, is a modulo is the remainder of a division. And we use this all the time in computing in order to get cycles, um, in order to wrap values around. So if I take any number, and divide it by 12, and also take the modulo of 12. And notice I'm working entirely in integers here. I don't want floating points. I want division with remainder, not division with a fractional answer. So 1 divided by 12 is 0 with a remainder of 1. 2 divided by 12 is 0 with a remainder of 2. 12 divided by 12 is 1 with a remainder of 0. 13 divided by 12 is 1 with a remainder of 1. So I'll hook a slider up to this. You can make a slider horizontal just by dragging it into a horizontal shape. This is the slider object, not to be confused with the multi-slider, which we've seen before. So as I move this up, note that my modulo here just cycles from 0 to 11. It's always the remainder of the division. So we can use this modulo So that regardless 
of where this fader is set. We're always going to see 0 through 11. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Move the slider to any position. And this is used all the time in music. If we look at the K slider, this is the K slider object. We get the same sort of note number out of the K slider. There's our middle C, note number 60. If we want to know what note we're playing regardless of what octave we're in, we can do mod 12. And all Cs, regardless of what octave, will be 0. All C sharps will be 1 regardless of what octave. All Fs will be five, regardless of which octave they're in. So, so this is a, a very commonly used tool in music, and it's also helpful for us here in working with this device, because it does have these multiple pages that we may not want to access. I'm deleting these things as I create them, just so my screen doesn't get full. You should keep them. I mean, keep notes on everything that I cover. Uh, if I delete it, you should copy it and paste it into a new patch or encapsulate it into a sub-patcher and keep it. And of course, add your own notes and comments. And as always, remember, just my tutorials are a quick introduction. The exploration begins after the tutorial finishes. Your work starts after you've done the tutorial. Uh, you start exploring and learning and connecting these things in different ways and getting them to function in different ways and coming up with questions uh, about the functionality of the objects and the possibilities of the objects. So modulo is one way, and of course this is giving us now a zero-based list. There's no way to avoid that. Uh, so if we want it to be one-based, we can simply add one. And now we're back to our familiar one based list with this button one, button two, button three, button four, up to button 12, regardless, because we're using the modulo, regardless of what the position of this slider is. But there's other solutions to this as well. And as I've mentioned before, Max is a many more than one way to do it environment. So this is one solution that might meet your needs, um, but but might, it might not. Like let's say you're in performance and you don't want the fader to be entirely ignored. You want two settings. If it's mostly to the left, you want it to give you one set of functions. And if it's mostly to the right, you want it to give you another set of functions. So this is easily achieved with logic. We can simply say, if the note number is greater than 60, and hook that up to a G gate. And now if the slider is in a leftmost position, it's gonna output to our left number box. And if the slider is in a right position, it'll output to our right number box. So this would be a very useful live performance modality of this device because you know even if you don't push it quite all the way over, you're still on the right side. And even if you don't get it all the way over to the left side, you're still on the left side. And you could divide it into three sections, you could divide it into four sections, um, uh, but the seven sections, as I mentioned, is a little bit hard to use in performance. So let's take a look at a couple other things that we can do here. And again, keep all of this work, set it aside, save a new version of this, because you're going to want to go back to this and take detailed notes on it and, and use it and try it and do things with it. So let's look at how we would use the note in as if it were a key and a key up object. We know that when we press it down, we have a velocity of 100. When we release it, we have a velocity of zero. So if we wanted the note in to separate our button presses and button releases, 
that's just another G gate. And we could say when this value is greater than zero. it's a button press, and when it's zero, it's a button release. So again, same structure here as we saw below. We're taking our note number, passing it into the G gate, and we're flipping the G gate based on whether it's the button being depressed or the button being released. And the reason why this works is because of Max's right-to-leftness. Things come out right-to-left. So first, the MIDI channel is reported. Second, the velocity is reported, which puts the gate in the correct position. Third, the note number comes out and is passed through the gate. So because of Max's right-to-leftness and because the objects are built with its right-to-leftness in mind, a structure like this functions easily. So notes on are reported on the right and notes off are reported on the left. So you could think of this as key and key up. Now we have the exact equivalent to the key and key up objects. There's lots of other things that we can do here. Um, first of all, I'm not doing my subtraction, so I probably want to do my minus 35 here just to get myself back into an easier to understand range of numbers 1, 1 to 12 12 and once I have these values I can start doing things with them so for instance a very simple thing to do is just to play some sounds And of course, I've got no way to stop this, so I could have any key up, pause, the playback. And so the reason why this is working is because the number here is ignored. The number simply triggers the message of pause. So regardless of which key is being released, it will pause the sound. Now one of the things that uh, we're not getting here is we're not getting the ability to play multiple sounds at the same time. And in order to do that, we'd need for these sound files to be separate. And we could use the select object to play the sounds. and we could have them pause on key up. And I can use exactly the same structure here to pause. My three sounds.
But of course you can start any process with this. You can play a video, you can recall a preset. So like many things in Max, we can take an entirely different approach to this. I'm gonna disconnect this part of the patch for the moment and go back to over here where we're separating it into left and right. And rather than using an analog to the key and key up objects, we can use the pack object to format our information into a list. So now I'm creating a two element list that tells me the status of each button. Button six down, button six up, button 12 down, button 12 up, because I'm taking the status of whether it's up or down and sending it over here to this receive up down. So one is down, one is up. Seven is down, seven is up. In combination with the route object, I can control a whole bunch of toggles using this approach. And of course you can visually lay them out. To better match what's happening. And control a lot of things this way. Another thing that you can do is recall presets. So remember the preset object when we create a preset, it's always a good idea to increase its slot size for visibility and ease of clicking. Connect this preset to some information that we want to store. Let's just say some dial settings. These might be controlling volumes, they might be controlling brightnesses, they might be controlling color. The left outlet of preset, we connect to specifically include objects in a preset. Set some values here. Whatever these values might represent, shift click to store. Set some different values. Shift click to store. Shift click to store. And we can now change between these settings using the preset, and we can trigger the preset using the NMSVE. So now when our fader is in the left position, we're controlling these toggles. And when our fader is in the right position, we're recalling presets. So extremely powerful, flexible tool. So many different ways to use it. And I'll show you one more method. 
save all of this, keep all of this work. I'm just clearing the decks here, which is the split object. And the split object will allow you to look for a range of numbers. So here I am in my ordinary mode. And in the leftmost position, these buttons are 1 through 12. And I will only get these values if they are 1 through 12. If I move my fader to the right, the split is causing those other values to come out the right outlet. So anything that's not within the range of 1 to 12 inclusive is going to come out the right outlet. And so you're probably seeing the possibilities here. I can split seventy-three to eighty-four. Subtract seventy-two. And now I've got a situation where when my fader is in the leftmost position, I'm getting my button presses here. And when my fader is in the rightmost position, I'm getting them here. And if the fader is anywhere besides the extremes, it's disabled because those values are falling out this outlet of the split. And of course, this can be used in combination with the velocity. to route button presses and button releases in both categories. Fader in the left position, button one press, button one release. Fader in the right position, button seven press, button seven release. Button eight press, button eight release. Fader in the left position, button 12 press, button 12 release. So we see that there's a tremendous number of ways to use this. Um, and, and we haven't looked much at the dial, at the control in, um, but the dial allows us to control one thing in a range of 0 to 127. So for instance, if we wanted to control volume, we just send it to a live.gain with a scale, it's putting out 0 to 127, and we want negative 70 to 0, our familiar range of the live.gain, and now our dial is a nice volume control. If we wanted our dial to be a transparency control, We could use this familiar structure. And now we have layer transparency on the dial.
And as one final note, the dial doesn't have to only control one thing. Of course, save this in a patcher, add your notes and comments, start a new patch if you need to. What button we've pressed can control the destination of our dial information. And a gate 12 is just like a G gate, except it's got 12 outputs, and the leftmost outlet is 1, whereas in a G gate, the leftmost outlet is 0. So let's take our values when the fader is in the rightmost position and just use it to open different gates so that we can send these dial values to a lot of different locations. I hit button 1, and now my dial is going here. I hit number 7, now my dial is going here. I hit number 12, my dial is going here. So depending on the last button I pressed, as long as the fader is in the rightmost position, I'm controlling where the dial is being sent. So that's a really powerful use of this, is a router. So in the left position, this will not happen. The dial will stay where it last was, regardless of what button I'm pressing, because the leftmost position of the fader does not send the buttons to the gate. But when I put it in the right position, now I'm selecting what the dial controls, and I can move the fader back, and now I'm triggering something else, but my dial remains in the last position it was set to. So this is just a few of the things, a few of the different ways you can route the information coming out of the noise machine so that you can control lots of different layers and parameters within your patches.